So artificial intelligence, it's around us. <laughs> it's going to be around us more. And I'm really excited to have Scott um, because Scott both works in artificial intelligence, but he also does uh, meditation retreats. I think you were with Byron Katie for how long? A nine, five day or something? Oh, yeah. So yeah. I think uh, so he walks in multiple worlds. So I think he's the perfect person to explore uh, the future of artificial intelligence and the potential role that mindfulness might play as things become more digitized and as robotics increases. Uh, and I thought before we jump into that kind of deeper conversation, I would love first, Scott, if you could just give us your definition of AI so at least we know how you're thinking about it, um, because I'm sure some people have a definition in their head. And yeah. It would be nice to get the definition that's in your head to start. Yeah, you know, it's, I'm glad you asked, because I feel like there's a funny thing happening uh, these days about artificial intelligence, where it's sort of like the greenwashing that occurred uh, in past years, where almost everything now is saying that it has some amount of artificial intelligence in it, um, everything from a spam filter to a, a board game player. Um, and for us at Vicarious, artificial intelligence has a very specific meaning, and that is that given the same sensory experiences that a human baby has from birth to adulthood, we need to write a computer program that can learn the same concepts and perform the same kinds of actions that that human would be able to do. Okay, so that's not all how everybody, <laughs> how, how everybody uh, defines AI, and I'm curious, how does Vicarious approach this topic, uh, maybe slightly different than what we're currently seeing played out? Yeah, I, I think the big distinction for how we think about it is, is between narrow and general artificial intelligence. And this is also sort of the distinction between uh, our animal ancestors like frogs and fish uh, and uh, jellyfish and so on, um, where they're really interesting animals. They're capable of lots of different behaviors. They can hunt for food, they can reproduce, they can avoid predators, but they're not um, able to adapt to new environments. They're not able to form a complex model of the world around them and uh, invent an iPhone or uh, learn how to drive a car. Um, right. And so that's the sort of narrow intelligence, and that's what we have today in our phones and in our Roombas is narrow artificial intelligence. So Siri will just look up all the information that's already created. It won't necessarily have an intelligence to know that like, oh, he asked for that before, maybe he needs this next time. Exactly, and even if it is able to anticipate your needs, it's because a, a human, probably in Cupertino, programmed it to be able to do that. Right, so, but you, so you wanna create basically thinking robots. Yes, that have thinking the potential, machines and robots, thinking machines absolutely. that have the potential to understand and to make decisions. Yes. Which is going to create a whole different world, no? It's true, and I, I mean, that's, that's why I'm doing it, because it has this potential to solve problems that are really hard for humans to solve today and to, to support us in ways that our machines haven't been able to support us in the past. So can you give some examples? Because some people are like, well, don't, aren't we enough as humans? <laughs> We're pretty good thinkers, right? Yeah. Can't we solve this? What, what do we need a robot to, to solve that we can't solve? And, uh, there, okay. Yeah, there's, so there's so many problems that are dangerous uh, or undesirable for humans to do, like uh, caring for patients with Ebola or cleaning up nuclear waste to the Fukushima reactor, that it would be wonderful if we had, or building a colony on Mars. Uh, it would be wonderful if we had robots that could do those kinds of actions and learn and plan on their own with you know, some supervision but minimal, minimal kinds of, um, of hand tuning and control uh, from humans. So that's one avenue where I see these kinds of general artificial intelligences mm -hmm. providing a lot of benefit to humanity. And I think the other avenue is if you think about why is cancer such a hard problem for us to solve or why is it so hard to invent fusion power? And I think that the answer to that question is that we're all limited by how short our lifespans are, uh, how slow our brains work, how hard it is for us to absorb new information from other humans and from books, and a generally artificially intelligent um, computer program or chip would be able to overcome and transcend some of those limitations yeah. and enable us to make a lot, a lot more progress a lot faster on problems that are really crucial to mm -hmm. You know, our human existence. And so some people, that worries some people, uh, including one of your investors, Elon Musk, Stephen Hawking, there's people who are thinking if they're smarter than us, we're screwed. Yeah. Uh, do you feel like, well, we just need to take that risk? <laughs> I, 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 think, I think it would be irresponsible of me to say, oh, we'll just need to take that risk. I think, so uh, from the invention of fire on, every technology that humanity has built can be used for uh, the betterment of all humans or the harm of all humans. And building a technology 
uh, and using it responsibly are inextricably linked. Mm -hmm. And it's something that we as a research community are already paying attention to, have been paying attention to for some time, will continue to pay attention to. Uh, but in a similar sense that it's possible that a, you know, a, a, super, a genetically engineered super virus could take out all the humans who are alive, or an enormous uh, asteroid could strike the Earth and cause an eternal winter. Um, these are things that are, I guess they're possible, but right. they're not something that are particularly likely in the near term, and we have researchers who study asteroids and who study genetic mutations and viruses, and it's important that they do that work and that they keep us safe, just like it's important that people research traffic patterns and better headlight configurations for cars. So. Good. I, well, it's, it does seem, though, that there's been, like, when the internet first created for the first, I don't know how many years, the number one uh, use of the internet was porn. Um, and so the, tech, no, <laughs> the technology arises and it gets used in all kinds of crazy ways. Or even you look at like a city like Palo Alto, which has like enormous technological intervention and they also have five times adolescent suicide rate because even though there's a place with the most Teslas and the most money, there's this human happiness that it doesn't address. Yeah. Uh, and I'm curious how you see the role of artificial intelligence being created and also um, our own human happiness and why you do things like go to 10-day meditation retreats and where can AI help us and maybe where can it can't? Yeah. And how might those two go together such that human happiness also increases? Um, and I, I hear you say, well, the menial tasks, well, definitely, that I can totally see that. Yeah. But um, when do the menial tasks, it's kind of like trust fund kids who don't have to work at all. Like they don't have any menial tasks, but they also have a lot of lack of meaning and lack of purpose. Yeah. And in a world where, you know, some people suggest in 30 years, the vast majority of jobs will be done by robots. How do we work on both levels at the same time? And have you thought about that? And how course, do you see those yeah. two interweaving? Long question, I know. It's a long question, <laughs> but it, it's a really important question. And, and it's one that I, I, I love talking about. So. Um, every new technology displaces jobs. And um, if we described uh, the world of, of what jobs were available back in the 1800s or the 1700s or the 1600s, they would look completely right. different yeah. from the jobs that App you developer. Do yeah. in this room, right? And so these transitions have always happened in, in the broader context of human history. And they're happening faster now, but it's not a fundamentally new problem. Um, I think what, when I hear people say, well, what if there aren't enough jobs? I think about the size of the universe compared to, you know, we're on planet Earth and we're solving planet Earth kinds of problems and not even that well. Um, the scope of things that need to be discovered, uh, explored, understood, solved, built, amplified in the universe is so enormous. Right. And to think that, oh, we'll have robots who are doing our dishes now and there's nothing left for humans to do anymore uh, is, I think, really underestimates the fascinatingness and the expansive possibilities that exist for us on this planet and beyond. Cool. And then how about the human happiness piece? Is it, um, do you feel like there is a technological solution to that? Or is it more that we have our own inner journey that we need to deal with separately? For example, um, you know, why you do a meditation practice, for example, when the, it seems like technology should, there's a certain group that feels like technology can actually solve all of our problems. Yeah. And there's another group that feels like, no, human happiness is an inner journey. Yeah. And that's always going to be an inner journey. And if we have, uh, all these tasks taken care of and all these amazing systems, mm -hmm. the unhappiness still resides in our hearts yeah. because of our own. And I'm curious in your own life, like, because you do go to meditation retreats and you do explore yeah. the inner journey, how do you, do you have a sense of how you make sense of that, at least for you? That was something I should have stopped. Hang on. <laughs> and you're trying to avoid the question? Yeah. Sorry, what were you saying? <laughs> um, so I, I think I can answer it both ways. So I think that technology has a role to play in supporting the inner journey. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think about, in my own case, I use an app to help me with my meditation practice. Um, I use Facebook to connect with other friends who are also engaged in these kinds of inner practices. There's lots of material that's on the internet and, and groups and events that I never would have discovered mm -hmm. without the help of the technology that's been built. Yeah. And there's a fundamental uh, internal commitment, I think, that needs to exist to developing oneself. Uh, and to growing uh, in, in the depth of one's practice around consciousness. Mm -hmm. um, now there's a science fiction question that like, part of me wants to jump in on here, which is to say that if someday in the far future we have the technology to individually rewire neurons in your brain, mm -hmm. um, then, because like, what we're doing when we meditate is we're rewiring our brains using the clumsy biological equipment that we currently have. 
if the conscious mind is the chair I'm sitting in, the unconscious mind is the entire room that we're all in together. And to try and manipulate the particles in this room from just this chair, it's very hard. Yeah. But if we could reach in with technology and make some tweaks mm -hmm. to help us reach a, a higher state of consciousness, a higher state of being oh, yeah, faster, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Then, then perhaps that could be something where right. technology could help us too. But obviously we're not there yet. Got it, got it. Wow, I'm just kind of holding that possibility. That would be a fascinating possibility, but not uh, out of question. Uh, and so I'm curious why this, so we are talking backstage, this isn't just a short-term project for you. Uh, why do you seem to have dedicated what I'm guessing is the plan most of your life, if not all of your life, to developing um, this, this particular kind of artificial intelligence? Um, yeah. What is it, what's your drive and what makes it so passionate? Yeah, area for you. It's, that's a, it's the easiest question, probably one of my favorite ones. Um, the, the reason why I got inspired to work on artificial intelligence is because I really cared about how to support human thriving. And um, when I think about all the different ways that I could do that or a person could do that, uh, artificial intelligence is, is one problem that if you solve it properly, uh, you actually solve a lot of problems, maybe even all the problems. If you can really build something that is truly generally intelligent like a human, but can think a trillion times faster and doesn't have to sleep. Um, <laughs> and so you could really make great progress on, on doing all of these things that would be impossible for one person to do in one lifetime. And that's what drove me to say, okay, this is what I'd like to devote my life to. Okay. And um, when robots do start to think, is there any, like, um, kill button <laughs> that we can um, create? Because in That's a really <laughs> violent thought, Soren. <laughs> it's a very violent thought. Because uh, inevitably, the, the smarter they become, uh, seemingly, they, if they had some level of consciousness, if we could create them, uh, they have their own desires and needs. So is there any way that we can allow them to think and allow them to adapt? Um, but they might not necessarily want to serve. It's kind of a far out question. But, I love far out <laughs> questions, it's great. But they might not want to serve humanity anymore. Uh, and people do have a, con I haven't studied it as much as other people, but other people who've looked into it are very afraid that, yeah. again, that like um, once that capacity for knowledge is there um, and they have more capacity than us, uh, what's our what's our role? Yeah, so I think it's important to factorize the difference between having a model of the world and like being able to predict what happens next and be able to understand the relationship between you know how do I grasp this cup? What happens if I drop it on the floor? And then how do I feel about that? Do I want water to be on the floor? Um, and so you can imagine an artificially intelligent robot or a uh, an oracle that you could ask questions to that knows. Infin in infinite times more than you and I could possibly know. But it doesn't have uh, a sense of self-preservation. It doesn't have its own desires. It's just information. It's just a predictive model that, that can imagine consequences and search through a tree of possibilities much better than you and I could. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't necessarily have consciousness. So when you're working... Depends on how you define consciousness. So right, what do you mean by that? Yeah, well, when you were, you're working... What, what you, it seems like what Vicarious is particularly its niche or its sweet yeah. spot or its vision yeah. is that things can self-learn on their own. So rather than a vacuum cleaner that's programmed, right, that just goes and it hits an edge and then it turns, and, or rather than um, a robot that's taught how to, how to flip a burger or something, you want the robot to actually be able to assess the world around it yeah. and be able to learn and realize, wow, I, I cooked that too much, I need to yeah. turn down the volume. I need to do this, or I see this is happening. And that level of, of cognition um, is a whole different step than what we have now. Right? Yes. So even self-driving cars, it's not using that level of intelligence, as far as I can tell. But this self-driving car <laughs> would look at, the, would, or the, the vicarious self-driving car would look at the world around it and be like, oh, I see this world, therefore I'm going to make these decisions because of perception. Yeah. And it feels like that's your... If I understand right, your sweet spot is actually can you teach um, a machine to have perception, analyze that, and then make decisions accordingly? Yeah. So let me, let me relate how, like, how I think about consciousness. So when I think about consciousness, specifically I'm talking about mammals, because you, know, you look at a, a lobster, it doesn't even have a brain, it's just a nervous system, and it's following a set of predetermined rules that evolution figured out. So let's restrict our discussion to mammals. And then I think about consciousness as a spectrum that starts with, with the lowest, simplest mammals, let's say mice or rats or something, where their awareness 
is of their immediate surroundings. Perhaps they have some amount of memory, but not a lot of memory. And then as you move up on the scale of complexity of, of, of the animal, you get to a notion of object permanence. Okay. Uh, and then you get to a notion of a sense of self, like the, you know, the primate will notice that it's wearing a hat and will take the hat off and will recognize itself in a mirror. And then, then perhaps you get to the point where the animal has some primitive language and has some concepts that it can access and it can sort of introspect into its own thoughts and it's sort of self-aware. Mm -hmm. And then at the highest level, I think about uh, animals like you and I where we have all of those things and our model of the world includes objects that are in this room and we understand those objects so well that we can realize that those objects are themselves conscious, having their own experiences. Mm -hmm. And we can simulate their thoughts and we can live vicariously through them, which is why we named the company Vicarious. Yeah. Right? <laughs> and so it's that spectrum that is, is our playground as a company. And you can imagine a, a robot or, or a program that has this highest level of consciousness and it can empathize or understand completely what your thought process might be and, and really understand you um, but it doesn't have a preference to say that, oh, it, it wants to make itself better than you or it, it you know, has a particular desire. Um, it can just understand. Got it. And how, where are we at today? And uh, is this coming? <laughs> you said, because I, I know Vicarious, it's, it's the long game. It's the long game. Um, but where are we at currently? Is there some assessment in terms of, I know you've made some huge... Uh, advancements in terms of reading the CAPTCHA? Yeah, so a things. couple years ago, we, uh, our first announcement as a company is that we could use our, our algorithms to read all of the CAPTCHAs on the internet. Um, but the, and, and, and you're just showing what's possible. You're just showing what's yeah. possible. But if you look at the headlines today, I think there's a big gulf between the world I'm describing to you as our, as our ambition and our vision mm -hmm. and what is the newest headline. So the newest headline right now is that there's a, a Google uh, program that can play Go the board game, the Chinese board game, with little pebbles on it. It doesn't pick the pebbles up at all. It just shows the boards and says what moves it'd like to make. Got it. And it's been trained on more games than any human could ever possibly play in their entire lifetime. Okay. And so it's cool, right. but it's not scary. <laughs> you like the scary. What's that? You like the scary. I don't like the scary. I like the positive. So I, I, think, the positive. I think the scary is the, the flip side, right? I like, I like nuclear power and not nuclear bombs. I like right. uh, fire for heat, but not wildfires. Right. But the self-learning aspect is, uh, maybe that was yeah. correct. The self-learning aspect is what excites you. Um, I think it's the, it's the building a model, a rich model of the world, and being able to really understand and refine that model the way you and I do, through interactions with it and through, um, through a, 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 a more human-like uh, artificial intelligence. Right. And that has machines play a very vital role that, of, of, of activities that humans are either unsafe for humans or humans' capacity, humans don't have the capacity to address. Yeah. I got and it. in collaboration, I also think that there's a lot of opportunities for human machine collaboration. Mm -hmm. And I know I kind of asked this before, but I'm curious. So, does you feel like your meditation practice allows you to, and Spiritual practice allows you to look at this topic differently than you otherwise would, or do you feel like they're, they're kind of, you do it just because it makes you feel better, and uh, do you feel like as a business person, there's a relationship between that? I, I think so. The way I think about it is that um, the, the artifact that you produce is a reflection of the process that goes into producing it. Mm -hmm. And so incorporating mindfulness practices and incorporating um, empathy and humanity into the process of building, of giving birth to this new type of consciousness is a, a really important prerequisite for, for doing a good job of producing right. the final artifact. Right. So in that way, I think it's helpful. And, and in another way I think it's helpful is that these are really big questions. Mm -hmm. And some of them are, can be scary questions or can, can hold a lot of emotional weight. And so having a meditation practice and being able to be really grounded in the process of evaluating a spectrum of potential outcomes and what is our best decision right. as an organization, yeah. as individuals. Yeah. It's really helpful to have that uh, as part of my uh, toolbox. Excellent, thank you, yeah. thank you. So that's it for our time. Um, Scott is also gonna be in the Q&A room, so if, there's want, if you guys wanna go more deeply into this topic, uh, he will be there, check your schedules. I think it's like in, uh, coming up soon, so but I wanna thank you. Yeah, thanks for listening. Thanks.